The culture is actually We're not urinating on fire. You can stop asking that question. I'm going to be calling the defense. I'm open. I'm all open. I'm calling both games. This video is proudly sponsored by Aura. Once in a full moon, I'll randomly search my real name on Google just to see what comes up. I expect stuff about the channel for obvious reasons, but there are times where my info will pop up on a people's search site. Everything there, just right for the taking. Where I live, phone numbers, family information free to find with the right search queries. It's emasculating and honestly kind of concerning. The thing is, the data brokers make bank selling your info to anyone who wants your information. Why do you think your phone's being flooded with endless spam calls? This is where Aura does its best to help you in that regard. They can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. The process itself is full of loopholes and twists, but Aura makes it super easy to do. It's an all-in-one protector of internet exploration. Parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more, all at one affordable price. So it's an easy decision. Risk your information being available for the taking or go to Aura.com slash Utree to start your two-week free trial. Information protection is paramount, and Aura does its best to help me out when I need it. Now on to the video. You should know that no matter what teams they put on Thursday Night Football, it will be a terrible game. Even the ugly, brutal powers of the AFC North will be no match for what's on display here. Folks, this is what we call an injury bowl. Most players worth watching will deal with some form of ailment. In the case of Mark Andrews, an injury for the remainder of the season. Baltimore would use their balanced attack to pull away in the end to make this a lopsided contest, but there's a very good reason for it. Joe Burrow's wrist died along with Cincy, thus proving that we can have no nice things in this league. Jake Browning had thrown only one pass before this moment, their opponent all but wins by default. As the Ravens hunt for any remaining survivors on the Gus bus, Logan Wilson will be playing a new game in the next night or two. Escape from Baltimore. After injuring three key players by playing football, the city will have him drawn and quartered if they find him. If only the loss were the worst thing the Bengals suffered this past week. When Joe Burrow started clenching his wrist, it was panicking time. With the calf injury that was ailing him, and him finally managing to get close to his true ability these past few weeks, things seemed to be looking up. Then came Baltimore. The moment he was unable to grip a football on the sideline, I knew shit was dying. Cincinnati, meet your worst case scenario. A season-ending wrist injury for Joe. A year of struggle and strife now turns into outright suffering. With Burrow not being on the injury report despite having a brace off the team plane, nothing else needs to be said. The Bengals needed Joe badly, and their future is now in the hands of Jake Browning, who will be making his first career start next week. Considering how it went against Baltimore, I'm gonna say this in the nicest way I possibly can. Sensei, you're fucked. Tennessee is dying. They have been for quite a bit. Scrounging for scraps of life support while their opponents kick them into the dirt whenever they try to move. In the harsh climate of Duval, the Titans were stripped bare and left to rot. Only the unforgiving sun beating down on them until they are slowly sapped of their remaining life. Any chance of escape fumbled upon them. Jacksonville merely drives away from the scene, satisfied with a win and a job well done. Tennessee can only stare into the abyss of the sun, eventually becoming delirious due to dehydration. They see fat guy touchdowns by Jeffrey Simmons in a fever dream. It's the only thing they'll want to remember from this beatdown. Probably the easiest win the Jags will have all year, if we're being honest. All you need to know about this game is that the Panthers were preparing to go into a silent count due to being flooded by Cowboys fans. The Panthers were at home this week. Frank Reich moving deck chairs around a sinking ship has taken over play calling duty again. It's a fucking shit pile over there. Watching this group flop around like a fish out of water is great comedy for the rest of us. Meet the Panthers, where actual points are scored on offense, then immediately followed by a kickoff out of bounds, where great third down stops are undone by unnecessary roughness penalties. Three times in the first half, twice on one damn drive where Bryce Young is sentenced to die behind whatever the fuck this is supposed to be. Under this shit show, Dallas merely had to exist and they would thrive. A standard cowboy meal of feasting on a shitty opponent. The only thing cooking in Charlotte is another pick six by Deron Bland. Hearing from Chicago is endless celebration, as a number one pick is all but theirs. Again. Despite the major changes that take place in the world, some things always stay the same. 
Every Sunday at FedEx Field, the only joy and hope will be in the opposition's fan base. Did someone forget to tell the commies that the New York Giants offense is the equivalent of a pearl mixed in baby puke? Tommy DeVito was probably training to be a plumber or a made man a few weeks ago, and now he's dicing the secondary too? You're letting that guy guide the G-Men to a great performance against you? What happened to Team Pride? What happened to pass coverage? What the hell right, happened no. to your offense? Like most times, if you have a struggling unit, all you have to do is play Washington. You'll thrive against them. Six turnovers made them look to be the world beaters they were last year. The only production in DC is an outright embarrassment and unofficial shutdown. A group that sacked DeVito nine times on the day and still lost by double digits. The fair on Del Rio can't be long for this franchise, right? With how horrible they played against the glorified Mac team, they're instant lol cows of the week. As New York trolls them relentlessly, there was no hot water in the locker room. But the commies couldn't even shower off the humiliation afterward. Well, something smells foul in Washington, all right. The Raiders' miracle run continue against a non-New Jersey team? That is the real question moving forward. Should I say the real question is if Miami can manage to get their shit together? Even after a week off, they just look unbelievably sloppy. Inconsistency, the name of the game on the offensive side of the ball. Great throws to Tyree Kill followed up by fumbles on runs by Tua. Deep drives to the red zone undone by stalling out at the one-yard line. Countered with another impressive drive and touchdown to Salvan Ahmed, and then countered again with another fumble. An arm punt by Tua to start the second half of play. Shanked field goals. For 400 yards of offense mean nothing if you go 3 for 11 on third down. The Raiders have a legitimate chance to steal this game away. And it's somehow being stopped by the Dolphins' defense. Odd because Aiden O'Connell takes one step forward and about two back with bad interceptions. The Dolphin offense is surprisingly sluggish for the rest of the game because their opponent is playing their hearts out. But a seven-point lead seems insurmountable to Las Vegas. AOC and Josh Jacobs can do nothing against this defense. The Raiders in general can't. Every shot they have is undone on fourth down, stuffed by a Dolphins team desperate to win. Yet they keep getting chances. And since they're only down by seven, tension fills the air in Miami. Good time, going deep, looking for Tucker, and one for Ramsey! You knew that the Dolphins' defense could bail out a bad game by the offense. That's a nice Uno reverse card this time around. Sorry, Las Vegas, you fought hard, but you just didn't have enough power to overcome your opponent. It happens. Better luck next time. A battle of two hot tanks turns into an exciting matchup, where Dazzle and Flair are showcased at the quarterback position. Kyler Murray versus C.J. Stroud in a fight to the death. That alone makes it a must-watch game. And it honestly felt strange. None the ways that C.J. Stroud flashed his incredible promise in the first half of play. Not in Arizona doing their best to keep up with the Texans, but in how sluggish things felt after the first half. It may be 21-10 Houston. C.J. might be making magic happen with Tank Dell before halftime, but Houston's unable to adjust to the Cardinals afterwards. Their offense just dies on arrival, and in inexplicable ways as well. Kyler's ability is showcased as well with a touchdown to put it to a five-point game, and it turns into a battle of defense. Whether that's due to the Texans buckling down with quality play calling or the Cardinals getting greedy and choosing not to take the points is to be determined. Even on muffed punts, Arizona looks rough, but then CJ lets it rip right into the hands of a defender on two consecutive drives. He must be making up for lost time or something. You figured the cards would take this one, right? That'd be no. Houston's defense holds firm. And despite an abnormal performance from Stroud, this game proved that the Texans defending 11 can take a game on their own. Yes, it is Arizona, I get it. But progress is progress. Houston's in playoff contention now. That is not a joke. Tell yourself that three months ago. This game is going to be such AFC North football that it's going to cause a rip in the space-time continuum. Dorian Thompson-Robinson is being chucked into the fire again to replace Deshaun. And Kenny Pickett will be thrown out there in the longest pass the Steelers will make all game. The standard is the standard in Pittsburgh. All the lucky breaks and opportunities given in the world, yet the Steelers will piss it away every chance they get. This offense is hoary. It's a long broken record, but with how badly they're butchering Pickett, he's turned chicken shit out there. He's so afraid of making a mistake he isn't throwing down the middle of the field. Brown's defense is destroying them not only physically, but psychologically. 
Kenny's regressed so badly that he can't throw a fucking football most plays. The dude got outplayed by a fifth round rookie. That's a level of pathetic I never thought I'd see. The only offensive production on the game for Pittsburgh were splash plays by Jalen Warren. Make that guy the offensive coordinator. He's the only one doing a fucking thing on that side of the ball. And he's still getting less touches than Najee. Yet somehow, this is still a game because the Browns offense is wrecked by injury and DTR can't solve the Steelers defense or receiver drops. Cleveland then remembers what's led them to wins in the past. Becoming the Steelers. They must rely on the bullshit to get them to victory. Too bad they're facing older brother and high-end talent will bail them out once again. Where's the high-end talent? Steelers, why are you letting DTR face a prevent defense? The high-end talent wasn't supposed to be for the Browns. Why are they so easily getting into field goal range? I was told there'd be endless bullshit for Pittsburgh. Why has Cleveland won the game? Why are they the ones that are seven and three? Where is the Tomlin sorcery I was promised? <sighs> Figures they deflate me like this. The Steelers have to do something about how horrible their offense is. You can't simply rely on the defense making endless splash plays to win football games. Matt Canada is running a middle school offense and lacks anything resembling talent or expertise. The fans have been calling for his head since last year. Fire Canada chants have been occurring at hockey games. And we all knew it was a mistake to bring him back. Pickett has straight up regressed into nothing as of late. The position players are getting outright pissed. Deontay's accosting coaches on the sidelines. Pittsburgh and firing coaches go together like holy water and a demon, but even they couldn't let this go on. Matt Canada has been delivered his pink slip on a fail pre-snap motion. Can't believe they actually did it. The Steelers fired a coach. The last one I can remember actually being fired was Tim Lewis. Almost 20 years ago. To find a coaching change in the middle of the year, you have to go back to 1941. The last time this happened, the Japanese had yet to attack Pearl Harbor. A true Thanksgiving miracle. I know it's probably gonna do little for the offense, just let me have this. I need false hope. Panic time for both franchises. Two teams with higher aspirations than sub-500 play trying to recover from agonizing losses last week. Someone forgot to tell the Chargers to stop the agony. Any chance at success dropped like a multitude of passes. Dead serious, the receivers can't stop dropping fucking passes. It's cost them at least seven points in the first quarter and allows Green Bay even a chance at glory. Jaden Reed will take that swinging door and run uncontested for an easy touchdown. You'd say that Joey Bosa would help out here, but more pain in Charger land. He was carted off with a foot injury. The way he was reacting, it might be long term. Not to worry though, Herbert will save his team like he always does, if only because a receiver of his can catch the ball for once. Begin the sheer brutality where both offenses do everything in their power to stumble and bumble upon themselves. The Packers are absolutely beatable, but the Chargers keep self-destructing in the red zone. Keenan Allen is supposed to be sure-handed. Not in this drop for an easy touchdown, he ain't. Austin Eckler doesn't fumble the ball often? Good to know, he fumbled near the fucking goal line in typical San Diego fashion. Points squandered at every turn. And all the Bolts can do is play catch up with a touchdown. Honestly, more stunned Keenan Allen caught a football for once. But it's here where that vaunted Charger defense comes to play. They allow Jordan Love to channel the spirit of Favre and Rodgers before him. Romeo Dobbs jumps up and steals the lead away with a deep touchdown. The first 300-yard performance of his career, Lambeau celebrates along with him. Liquid LA responds with a coup de grace. Herbert, look at There's the pump. Johnston can't pull it in! Somehow I'm unsurprised when the Chargers keep shitting the bed like this. It's repeated nearly every week. Justin Herbert is the only thing keeping them afloat. The rest of the team breaks down and people somehow blame Herbert for it. Green Bay wins mostly because the Chargers chargered as always. Five of their six losses within three points. The definition of pain. Soon enough, Brandon Staley's about to explode. You can stop asking that question, okay? I'm going to be calling the defenses. Okay? So we're clear. So you don't have to ask that again. And hopefully you'll be calling an unemployment office in a few weeks as well. <laughs> Chicago's last shred of hope is returning for one last gasp at relevance. Justin Fields is back from his thumb injury. While the season is all but lost, the Bears can figure out what to do for next year in games like this. Or will Detroit simply become the Edsel and disappoint us all? The Lions realize that the auto strike is ended, right? 
no need for the team to hypothetically go on strike against Chicago. Jared Goff has somehow morphed back into 2019 form, and I have no idea how the fuck it happened. It takes a special kind of bad to make the Bears look competent, and the Lions are turning it into a reality. They're doing the classic play down to competition trope at Ford Field with a four turnover day. It's a rare sight for Detroit these days, but there's always a time for a throwback. And the unbelievable is happening. Ooh, the Bears are up by 12 with four minutes left. An upset is within their grasp. They're a bad team, but there's no way they choke this away, right? They choke. Of course. Bears fans talked all that shit in the preseason about this team. Detroit didn't even show up until the final three minutes and still managed to bullshit out of way. Lions fans, it was ugly, but you can wake up. Incompetence can be escaped. And the reward is being 8-2 for the first time since JFK was president. I wouldn't recommend making this a trend. Against most other teams, Detroit loses by 20. Learn how to tackle someone in the open field and maybe then I'll stop wondering if I have doubts about you or not. San Francisco is on a revenge tour after suffering a few humiliating losses over the past month or so. Who's the first victim of their wrath on the docket? Tampa Bay. Sorry Bucks, you picked the short straw of the bunch. The Niners are gonna make you try and outgun them in an arms race and you're a few weapons short of an arsenal. It was going to be a near impossible task to win any way you looked at it. But with a healthy 49er offense, that secondary of yours is not only going to get battered, it will fall apart. Brock Purdy's back to making incisions against blown coverage is a plenty all game long. Baker tries, but he can't power through. San Francisco wins easily and retakes a one game lead on their division. It's good to bounce back to old form. Nothing against you, Tampa, it just happens. You'll have other chances. There's some great news for Buffalo coming up. Despite how rough they've looked over a good bit of time, they have the perfect antidote for their woes. They get to play the New York Jets at home. With this fortuitous fortune in their affairs, the Bills can rehabilitate their image. They can take it easy and pick apart their opponent's stout defense slowly but surely over time. All the Bills D has to do is let the Jets keep tripping over themselves. No, no, no. It's so fucking bad, my dudes. Zach Wilson has gone from absolute crap to somehow even worse. This guy's a deer in headlights behind this trash heap of an O-line. He literally can't throw a football anymore. The fucking punter threw with more authority and precision than he did. With every Bills possession ripping apart the defense, Wilson offers absolutely no confidence since he nor Hackett have an answer for it. There wasn't much hope left, but this may be rock bottom for his career. Zach wasn't just benched in the third quarter, he was replaced by a guy who's known for holding a clipboard and looking professional. Tim Boyle. Fucking hell. New York's defense finally breaks and Buffalo is delighted to watch their opponent be killed by wild animals. More so that it gets them back into playoff contention for the time being, but it's only a start. Most opponents aren't as broken as the Jets. I don't know why the hell it is, but Seattle always tends to have trouble with the Rams. At least since McVay got here, the Seahawks will either keep them in the game for way too long or lose to them in humiliating fashion. What happened here? The same damn thing. They keep failing repeatedly in or near the red zone, and it cost them on several drives in the second quarter when Seattle could have buried their opponent then and there. I know what you're thinking. Oh, it's a 13-0 lead. The Seahawks can cruise to a win easily. Do you know what team you're watching? It's never easy. There are curveballs thrown their way. K9 and Gino were lost for a good bit of the game. Some Seahawks fans out there got their wish. Horsecock Lock is out of the oven ready to sling fire. Incredibly inaccurate fire that makes you wish he was never cooked. Put his ass back in. He's getting a paycheck from the Rams with what he's doing. It forces the defense to bend under the face of adversity, giving up endless yardage to their opponent again, but they can blame everything on ref ball again this time. This pass interference was pretty ticky-tacky to be fair, but it's hard for me to have sympathy when you have 130 yards of penalties on the game. A good chunk of them justified. Maybe it caused the offense to suck ass under lock too. Maybe it caused Tariq Woolen to take an illegal use of hands penalty on a third and 15. Rams simply whittle down the clock to next to nothing, get near the goal line and kick a chip shot to go up by one. Not to worry though, Gino's back on the field slinging again. Great, the Seahawks are getting bailed out of their own failures again. Just kick the field goal, end the game, and avoid reality for another week. Kick on the way, leaking right, and it's no good! Or not. 
Every Seahawks fan and their mother is bitching about ref ball, but this loss was a hell of a lot more than that. It's another game where Seattle had their adversary right by the throat, but refused to do anything to finish the job until the last moment. Self-inflicted wounds killed them more than ref ball ever could. With that schedule theirs coming up, they needed this one badly. The Seahawks are looking mighty fraudulent, and San Francisco looms large. Prove me wrong, Seattle. I'll be happy to eat shit if you do. You blew it, boy! You really blew it! Two of the hottest teams in football in a primetime match. Imagine saying that a month ago. It was a borderline tank bowl back then. Early on, it appeared that the Vikings' miracle run would continue for another week. Denver's offense has been sputtering. And against Minnesota's odd assault and blitzing, they can't get much of anything going. Simply field goals as they stall out just before the golden lands of the end zone. As it's 10 to 9 at halftime, the Vikings know they need to push the envelope to truly seal the deal. But with the pastor not engineering a touchdown drive of his own, it should be more than enough. I hate to inform you, Minnesota, but finishing a game winning by more than one possession is illegal. Denver's defense remembers they have a shitload of talent on it. And the Vikings proceed to fuck the ball at nearly every opportunity. Turns out Minnesota tends to fold under constant defensive pressure, and two brutal turnovers allow Denver to get within two. The Vikings could use a win though, and they'll pull out all the trickery on fourth down to try and seal the deal. They burn a shitload of clock, they get to around the 10, but they just stall out. Field goal kicked, and Denver has a chance. And to be fair, that's all you need in the NFL. Minnesota's defense finally cracks under the face of adversity. They can't stop anything on this drive. And a Broncos fumble had eyes and rode out of bounds. The inevitable is about to commence. They do. Vikings bring the heat again. Wilson throwing up for glass and is caught for the touchdown! I think the magic may have run out for a bit in Minnesota. All that we have is endless hopium in Denver. Everyone within a 300 mile radius of the city should shelter in place immediately. The toxic fumes of a four-game winning streak will drunkenly stumble into your heart if you aren't careful. Or get suspended again like Kareem Jackson is. This is merely part of the ride. And it never ends. Never. A heavyweight bowed at Arrowhead, just as the gods had imagined. Both fighters pounding their opponent like the rain pounding the field of play. Only if Kansas City managed to connect on their damn punches instead of giving the Eagles a chance to breathe. Who knew that the Chiefs' defense would be the ones carrying the team? Philly's high-flying attack has been neutralized on all but a handful of plays for the most part. Chris Jones is killing Jalen Hurts, but the offense is killing itself. It's literally a repeat of their week one performance against Detroit. Repeated failures to capitalize on opportunities as they get caught in a haze and only explode on themselves. This receiving core was supposed to be good? All I'm seeing is of later their favorite kind of candy. Drops. If they had hands, this is a multi-score game. And you can't fuck up like this against the Eagles because, oh, look at that! Philly's finally broken the defensive spell. They've only been doing this the entire fucking year. Good news for them, they swiped the lead away from the home crowd. Down by four, the Chiefs offense still goes flat. There's one more chance for Kansas City, yet they're still failing to do anything of note. Yet somehow they will the ball down the field. Losing at home? No, they're going to be dragged to a win, kicking and screaming. Good protection aired out. Valdez Scantling dropped it. I had a woody retort for this colossal fuck up, but like the Chiefs receivers, it was dropped. And to add insult to injury, guess how the game ends? You guessed it, a dropped pass. The Eagles get a 9-1 brotherly shove, and Kansas City is looking as suspect as the hands on their receivers are. Billy still has no consistency, but with implosions like this, the hell needs it. We blew it, pants. What do you mean, we? Bring out, Jaden! Unit lost. 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 Unit 
Unit lost. Unit lost. Unit lost. Unit lost. Unit lost. Unit lost. The bloodlust of the football gods will never be quenched. Amen. Here's Henry Wildcat to get it back to Levis. Levis gonna put some air under it. Towards the end zone, it's caught. Hopkins, touchdown. So Tennessee with a little bit of a magic trick.